Hi, I'm Roger Palmer with Pasco Scientific. We're going to talk a little bit about water quality today. And as you can see, it's a great day to be able to go outside. And I love that it ad adds a better understanding of both chemistry, agriculture, and sciences, biology, and all the things that can be involved. If you've gone down to this creek just to enjoy it, to see wildlife, to uh, go fishing, or to use it um, in terms of uh, enjoyment for uh, activities, then let's talk about what makes it safe, what makes the quality of water uh, both good for the life that's inside and for us to use. Uh, first thing when we go out into a water quality sort of study is to, to find a place that's safe. Um, and you'll see that this is a great example of shallow water. Um, and you can see that it's easy access to gathering samples. Sample bottles can be taken both in small quantities if you're just doing a few tests, uh, especially with non-destructive methods like using probeware, um, or if you're gonna use uh, a lot to test chemically, then we're gonna grab larger samples to bring back. We're pretty close to where the lab is, so we're not gonna worry too much, just gather the water here and bring it back, where it's more organized if you're doing that in your classroom. And uh, finally, if you're going to take them from some place that's a little farther away, I'd suggest taking your samples, putting them into a cooler with ice in them so that they slow down the, uh, the biological activity, and that way you can use them with class the next day, um, and those are going to be working. First of all, we're gonna take a small sample and show you that process. You're going to first take the cap off, rinse it a couple of times, fill it and then cap it underneath the water a couple of inches, okay? So let's do that so I can show you that process. Okay, rinsed it three times. I'm gonna turn it upside down, fill it with water a couple inches underneath the surface and I'm gonna put a cap on that underneath the surface so it's nice and contained, all right? Now, if you have a couple of students going through, you can make observations about the area here. The water is pretty clear. It's kind of tea colored. So it's got some um, dissolved materials from plants that are in the area. Um, it smells great. It looks nice and clear. There are lots of things like little bugs, uh, flying insects. I can see lots of minnows in the bottom and all those are gonna be good indicators of water quality. Now let's do the large sample. We'll rinse that out a couple times. And this last, yeah, you know. Then last time I'm gonna put it underneath, fill it up to the top, and we'll seal it. And make sure that comes out good. Here you see we've gotten our water quality, and we're gonna take it back to take a look at it in the lab. As you can see, we've returned back from the creek. You can see the water quality here. You can see the color of that and the, the clarity that's there. I've distributed those into some uh, testing uh, jars so that we can use these different instruments to test the quality of those. I wanna take a second to talk about each one of them and then we'll show you how you set up um, to standardize each of those, to put a reference to each of those. Um, the first one we're gonna talk about here is temperature. And the temperature, of course, is uh, gonna be important because the water has the ability to hold uh, gases in it. And the warmer it gets, the less it will hold. If you've brought a soda can out of the refrigerator, the gases that are dissolved in there stay in a lot longer when the soda is cold, and then they bubble out if it's warm and goes flat. Um, the next one is pH, and that's gonna be a measure of how much acid is in the water. pH ranges from one to 14. Around seven is what we would typically expect, and most animals are highly sensitive to that, especially when they're young and eggs. Um, they're sensitive to the change in pH, and it would cause um, that to be a harsh situation if it changes much from seven. Turbidity is going to be what we'll use next. The turbidity is how cloudy that solution is. You can look in and you can see there's a little cloudiness there. Uh, but the more cloudy it is, the more it's able to gather uh, sun's energy and uh, it will stop the light from penetrating down to the bottom, maybe for plants that could grow and keep delivering oxygen. Also warm up the water source. The next probe that we'll talk about is the dissolved oxygen probe. That amount of oxygen, just like you and I need oxygen to breathe, the animals that live in the water can absorb oxygen through their gills. Um, and be able to live in that situation. Typically that ranges from one to 14. Um, six and above is livable, and if you get below six, it's gonna to start to cause fish to die. Um, and those are in parts per million or milligrams per liter. 
The final one is how conductive the solution is, and this is a conductivity sensor, and that's how much salt is dissolved. Various ionic compounds dissolve into water. Um, if you sit in a bathtub or wash your hands long enough or been swimming, you'll notice your hands start to prune. That'll govern osmotic processes that are in the water and make it healthy for uh, the things that live there. So we're going to measure those things in solution. But before we do, it's important that several of these are highly sensitive. For example, the pH sensor. The pH sensor needs to be calibrated. And what we'll do is I'll show you the hookup and how we're going to run this inside the program to do the calibration. And then we're going to run through the, the quality tests. If you look in your uh, computer, um, we've got the um, SparkView file that's going to allow you to have sort of a window in all of these five uh, water quality variables. Um, what we want to do is to make sure up in the sort of Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, sorry, connection area, uh, we're going to want to make sure that this particular probe is connected. Now I've connected those and if it wasn't, it would be down here and yet to connect devices. But you can see that this is the pH sensor. It is connected. I will say then done. And to make sure that this is calibrated, we want to click on the live display here and we're going to calibrate that measurement. The pH has got two different places you can test to make sure that it is actually reading correct values. And so what we'll do is we're going to rinse this pH sensor off a little bit, the mineralized water, and we're going to test it in two solutions. This one is a pH of 10. This one is a pH of 4. So I'll go ahead and say I'm going to use the two-point solution uh, calibration. Okay, and we'll continue. Now it's asking me to test it in the pH 4 solution, which is right here, and we sell those. You can get buffered solutions at pH 4 to test these. Um, and so we're going to go ahead and put that into that solution and make sure it's got good contact. If you look that the values in that sensor are going to change, it's around 167 or so. I'll move it around just a little, make sure that we get good contact with solution. And then when it's steady, I'll go ahead and set the calibration. It looks like it's doing pretty well around 170. Okay, we'll take that out. I'm going to rinse it. So I'm able to put that in the next solution. Although the buffering will help to keep that from cross-contamination. Um, it is always good to rinse them between any times you check a solution with the mineralized water. Go ahead and put that in there. Make sure that that doesn't get too variable and it looks like a place where it's steady. I'll go ahead at 152, it looks like. And I'll set that calibration and we will rinse those off. Now, any of these instruments, if you are looking to see where the calibration uh, process is, if uh, you want to see more about those, you can go off to the website for those. I will just show you real quick. We'll say OK at the bottom. Um, and if you are looking at the product page, like, for instance, this pH sensor, you can go down into the Documents tab here, and you're going to see a wireless reference guide. That will open up and talk about, uh, let's see, right down here to the calibration section. And that's where you can find calibration information for all of our probes. So with that, um, we're going to be on to testing. And now the exciting part. Let's see what these variables are so we can see how um, healthy the water is in the creek that's just outside. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to take our temperature sensor. Now, I could pour and test these little bottles, but since they're small, they lose their heat or warm up to the uh, atmosphere here inside the building. So I'm going to use this larger body of water, which should be more like what's outside in the creek still. Um, it's going to lose heat much slower. And so we're going to put that into this larger body and see what the temperature is. As you watch, you can see in the screen on the bottom here, there's a variable that's the live feed. And so you can see the temperature is responding. It's 22 degrees, which is great because it's a little bit warmer in the lab here. The next one we're going to take a look at is the pH. And I'll put that inside. Make sure that looks pretty good. It says 7.54. That's that's a good value, acceptable. Inside of the cloudiness, that last one was for acids, for pH. And the cloudiness, I'm just going to take a little cuvette of this water. We're going to put that in here. We're going to see how cloudy that looks. The next, we're going to use the dissolved oxygen sensor. We're going to put it in this larger body of water just because it's larger and it is more stable in there than trying to put it in a small little container. I'd look just to see what the values are coming out. as oxygen, 8.5, 8.5. 
yeah, that looks pretty good. Seven, eight, somewhere in that range. Um, that's acceptable. And finally, we're going to take a look at the saltiness or the conductivity. Ionic substances dissolve into separate ions and they conduct electricity. Um, the more the salt is in there, the more it changes things like osmosis and um, driving water in and out of cells for the animals that live there. So I'm going to go ahead and it looks like the live values look pretty well. Let's make sure that comes out well on the screen. So I look across again, 22, 23 degrees uh, for temperature, 7.45, somewhere in there um, for the pH. Turbidity is five units, so that's pretty clear. Um, it has to be pretty milky before it gets up into the hundreds or something. You'd see the milkiness. That looks pretty clear in our large jar. 290 for the conductivity. Um, I find that that's absolutely normal stream. Um, the ocean is six, 65,000, 67,000, something like those for seawater. And so 300 is great. Um, and the last one, we've got four and a half um, milligrams per liter of the dissolved oxygen. And what I can do is just make sure it's not sitting on the bottom, you know, over the sensor. So it's getting fresh water on there. And I'm going to go ahead and say stop. After which now you can take those values and answer the questions that are on the back of the sheet. We'll be back in just a second for some analysis. Now that you've gotten the water quality data, you've transferred that to your um, uh, analysis page. Um, let's talk a little bit about each of these values so that you can uh, interpret them the best and answer those questions. Uh, we'll start from the, the top here in the temperature scale. And temperature, of course, we talked about a little bit, but saying that the warmer the water is, uh, the more biological activity that can happen. So the things are decomposing faster, any reaction. Um, the things that live there, they'll have a higher metabolism. Decomposition happens faster. Um, it also drives out gases. And so um, typically our, you know, sort of living things are used to uh, sort of what average temperatures we range. Obviously, as you get colder, uh, some of those biological processes slow down some, but gases increase. Uh, if you get to, towards freezing, that's not, uh, that's not healthy for the biological activities. And so that'll be a little lower quality, but as you get into sort of room temperatures, 20s, 30s, um, and it isn't quite to, you know, really hot temperatures, uh, we don't want to get there. But that can help you to determine uh, what goes on in that water um, and how it's driven by the temperature. Um, you can always take a look at those. In the pH, uh, we can see we have about seven and a half. The pH scale we talked about goes from 0 to 14, uh, where the lower numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, are acidic, um, acid rain, 4, uh, 5. And, um, and if it's got a little bit, 8 or 9, that's typical for ground chemicals that it might run over, like limestone, um, you might see. So you can take a look and see if it's in that sort of healthy range and, and give a description of those. Turbidity. Uh, it can range from zero to 100 is just slightly cloudy. And so you can see just even in this sample here that we're looking pretty clear and we have evidence of that as well, um, not just in the turbid turbidometer, but also just looking at the sample. We've gotten the conductivity, 290 uh, microsiemens per centimeter, uh, 200, 600, 500 are very typical in streams, um, unless you start to get into places where there is a lot of groundwater that is near places that dissolve and what dissolves in water like cave formations or uh, salts that have been deposited in, in areas, old sea bottoms, centers of the continent, for instance, will leave a lot of salt behind. Um, you might hear of names of creeks that are uh, salinous, uh, uh, they have the word salt in them or salt licks, if you know that there are those areas. And so you might see those numbers get higher in areas that have salt that's available for the water source. Finally, the, the dissolved oxygen, we can say runs from zero to 14 in the colder temperatures. It really does get quite a bit higher, uh, but it does need to be sort of in the middle of the range for best quality of life. Um, and you will see examples of that when you're down there. If it's high quality, you'll see these very fine structured like uh, insects, mayflies or dragonflies that are out there are going to be medium quality, a um, little more sturdy. Minnows and fish are mostly in the medium quality. And then if there's nothing but just the sort of uh, worms or uh, leeches or uh, things that can really handle 
uh, low quality water, slow, slow uh, swimming fish like carp um, that can exist in pretty low oxygen levels. Um, you can see that's going to happen. Now, you may say, well, what are those exact, exact values? And we do have a couple of resources that will talk in more detail than this, um, which I can refer you to. Uh, first of all, if we come over to the page, we've got the uh, PASCO site, which will talk about each of these instruments. And we've seen that already in the, in the handbooks that are given, the, that also come with the equipment. Uh, but you can, well, let's start from here. The agricultural manuals uh, are going to give you a little bit of background, and we've gotten those in the experiment lab. Um, there's a water quality field guide that has more information in those. Um, you can go online. U.S. Geological Survey is going to be a great starting place if you type in USGS and water quality information. Um, they will sort of discuss these quality sort of variables by topic, and you can see I've got pH, temperature, nitrogen, other kinds of variables that are there, even ones we haven't measured. So if you want to read more about those to see what that um, safe range is, um, I hope that just talking a little bit about what we've measured and what seems sensible in terms of temperatures that are average, oxygen values that are average, uh, pH right in the middle of the range, those are good enough for you to answer the questions that are in the back. And you can um, use this to finish up your analysis before you turn in your assignment.